Hi, this is Chef Paul and welcome back to Wine Basics. You know, we've traveled down this little road and invariably we had to get to Champagne. And um, I love Champagne. Um, I really want people to understand that Champagne doesn't necessarily have to be for a special occasion. You know, it's Thursday, drink some Champagne. All Champagne is, is wine with bubbles. Now, Champagne is a word that's often misused. There are some very specific and very strict rules about the term champagne. And um, that's why I'd like to start with you a bit today. About 90 miles northeast of Paris is the Champagne region of France. It's an actual area that has four important growing regions within that area. And, and typically, um, Montage de Rhum is usually classified as the most important of those regions. To be called Champagne, the wine must be produced in that region of France. And, and what's really interesting about the Champagne region is as far back as 1927, some very, very strict rules were set in place for that region, okay? There's less than 78,000 acres of grapes, which I know sounds like a lot, but it really isn't. The cepage, or the grapes, there are only three kinds of grapes that can be used to make champagne. And that's Chardonnay, which is a white grape, Pinot Noir, which is a red grape, and Pinot Meunier, which is also a red grape. But you're thinking to yourself, well, wait a second, champagne's white. Yes, it is. And if you remember the other day when we were talking, the only thing that makes red wine red is when it's left in contact with the skins. Okay, we're going to get back to that in a few minutes though. So there's also rules about viticulture. They actually have rules regarding the spacing of the vines, how tall the vines are allowed to be grown, and even the yield amounts that are allowed for each vine. Harvest is only by hand. So that 78,000 acres, no machine harvesting at all is allowed. Only hand picking of the grapes. And then interestingly, bottle age. So for a champagne that is not a vintage, it has to be aged for at least 15 months. Now if it's a vintage, and I'll talk about vintage in a moment, then it's got to be aged in that bottle for three years. Then it can be released. So that by the time you've actually opened that bottle of French champagne, it sat somewhere for a couple of years to age. Okay, And it's important to understand that that what makes it champagne is how it is produced and where it is produced. So you can't talk about champagne without talking about Dom Perignon. And a lot of people think he invented champagne. He did not. But he is really credited with a lot of pretty interesting things. You know, it's said that he one time tasted this wine with bubbles and he uh, pronounced, I'm drinking stars. Well, Nobody knows if he really said that or not, but he did come up with some pretty neat processes. He did actually invent the basket press that is used to press all these red and white grapes so that we get a white must, that original pressing juice, out of it. He's credited with the blending process that's used by Moet and Chandon to this day. And then he also did something pretty neat. He came up with an idea of using a string to secure the cork to the bottle so that the bottle, the corks didn't pop out and the bubbles were retained in the bottles for years and years. So pretty interesting all the, um, all the additions and credits that this guy has given, yet the main thing people think that he did, he really didn't do. He didn't invent champagne. So um, some pretty neat things to understand about champagne and it's all about production. You'll see on some bottles it'll say the champagne method. Um, the EU has some really strict rules and, and back a number of years ago, many, many cases, over a thousand cases of Andre Champagne that were being shipped to Nigeria were actually destroyed in Belgium because they said champagne on them and they weren't from champagne. So they're pretty strict. After the wine is pressed. That first initial must, remember that word must, it is the cuvee, it is 
that first fermentation happens in wood or stainless steel tanks. Then something important happens. The, um, there is something called the tirage, which is an addition of a sweet juice that's added, that residual sugar added back to this must, and then it's put into bottles and capped with a regular old bottle cap, okay? This is where the aging happens, and this is the real important things. The bottles are stored upside down, with the necks facing down, in giant racks in caves where they're stored. And somebody has to go down every single day and give each bottle a quarter turn. Every single bottle, a quarter turn. And as he's given them a quarter turn, he tips the bottle up a little bit more each time. And over the course of months to years, that bottle will eventually be all the way almost vertical. The reason this is done is because of something called the lees, or dead yeast cells, any kind of debris, will all slide all the way down into the neck of the bottle. And it's critical, because you don't want that stuff in your champagne. So what happens is, and this, by the way, this whole process, um, the remouage or the riddling, that all has happened to get all that stuff into the neck, and then, really interesting, this is when a little technology takes place. These bottles are dipped into a tank of very cold liquid, sometimes even liquid nitrogen, to freeze a plug at the bottom. And you can actually watch some pretty neat videos on this. They go through a tank, the plug is freezed, the bottle cap is popped off, and this plug psh, shoots out of the bottle. Okay? Now, very quickly, the bottle is turned back up, and this is when something called a dosage. By the way, that process is called the disgorgement. It actually sounds like what it is, the disgorgement. Then the dosage, a small amount of um, wine is added back in with a little bit of sugar to give the yeast something to eat onto. And then the cork is placed in and it's caged, okay? So that whole process of riddling disgorgement, adding back the dosage, and then corking, and then caging happens so that it will preserve the CO2, those bubbles, okay? And the bubbles are what champagne is all about. It's all about the bubbles. Don Ho talked about tiny bubbles. So that's the important bit about processing champagne. And you will see if it, is, if it says champagne method, typically that means it's been produced in that method in the bottle. Now, not all champagne is made that way. Again, like I said before, champagne is just wine with bubbles. Sometimes, industrial size, enormous vats of wine will be made, and then like your soda stream at home, they'll stick it in the bottle and pump CO2 in the bottle. Bada bing, bada boom, you're done. You've got sparkling wine, okay? And that's really what it ought to be called. If it's not champagne, then it's just sparkling wine. Different countries have different names for their sparkling wine. Now, interestingly enough, in France, if the sparkling wine is not produced in champagne, um, it'll be called uh, typically Cremant or a Vin Musso. Because even in France, if it's not made in champagne, it cannot be called champagne. Now, in Italy, you'll hear of spumante or prosecco. And um, in Germany, it'll be called sect. Um, in Spain, they'll call it cava. A and in Australia, I like this one, they call it sparklers. Um, in California, I think they call it whatever they want. You still see champagne used, but it really shouldn't be, all right? So hopefully, you'll go out and enjoy some champagne. My favorite um, thought when I teach students about champagne is I show them a clip of Marilyn Monroe in a, the fabulous movie The Seven Year Itch when she talked about drinking champagne in the afternoon with potato chips. Everything's good with champagne. You know what? Everything's better with champagne. So go out and get a bottle. And when we come back, I've got a bottle of Prosecco that we're going to open up 
and give a little taste to. So come join us again. This is Chef Paul saying, have some champagne. <laughs>